Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. I'm so thankful that uh, you're in house tonight and also those of you joining us on Facebook Live, we welcome you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. May the Lord bless our time together. Looking forward to uh, services this Sunday. This is Memorial Day weekend. And I know that's a big weekend for a lot of families as uh, we remember those who have gone before. And especially as, as it Memorial Day was started and began to remember our soldiers who, were, uh, who died in battle. And so uh, may we take time to remember those this weekend. We will have Sunday school at 10, worship service at 11, and uh, of course, and we'll be on live as well. And if you can't be here for Sunday school in, in person, we also provide a, an online Sunday school taught by Brother Larry Gergen. Uh, that is wonderful. We'll uh, be finishing up in our series, um, Living with the End in Mind about Christ's Return. I believe this is the last Sunday of that, so we'll be finishing that series up. I've enjoyed preaching through it, and I know many of you have enjoyed teaching through it as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for this time you have uh, given us, and you have given it to us. And so, Father, help us to be good stewards of this time. Help us to focus our attention upon you, uh, to love one another, to love you, and Lord, uh, to feed the sheep as you have called us to do. And Lord, as we open uh, the Bible here in just a few moments, we pray, God, that, uh, that you would just use the Holy Spirit to work through the words to minister into our hearts and souls tonight. And Lord, that this time will be used uh, to benefit our faith and our uh, dependence upon you in all things. We thank you for this church, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless our time together and our prayers and those who have joined us. There are many needs out there. there are many terrible things have even happened uh, in our nation and around the world, even this week. And so many things are just heartbreaking. And God, all I can say is please have mercy. Please have mercy. Help us, oh God. Help us. Help us from destroying ourselves. Lord, you are our hope. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Brandon, if you will, come and lead us in a hymn. Good evening, West Side. Yeah, when I was thinking uh, about selecting a hymn tonight and all things going on in the world, and it's things seem a little bit crazy right now but you know there is an assurance that uh, and it's in Psalms 73 28 says but as for me it is good to be near God it is good to be close beside him because I tell you that's the only comfort that I'm getting now these days so let us all stand we will sing near to the heart of God it is 458 in your hymnals we'll sing all three verses of it 458 in the hymnal of quiet rest near to the heart of God a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God oh Jesus bless Redeemer sin from the heart of God Wait before thee, 
There is a place of full release near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless, Redeemer, sin from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, on these Wednesday nights, the last uh, few weeks, we're looking at finding hope and happiness in the heart of Christ. Finding hope and happiness in the heart of Christ. And as we've already shared with things that have gone on in our nation and uh, the news that we see every day, we certainly need hope. Amen. And in all the saddening news, there are many that need happiness. And it is in the heart of Christ, near to the heart of God, where we find both of those things, true hope and joy in our heart. And tonight I want us to think about the heart of Jesus sympathizes with us. We're going back to a familiar passage and one we, it's not been that long since we looked at, but we're looking at a different point of the passage. And we're going to be reading from Hebrews in chapter 4 and reading three verses, 14 through 16. And the Bible says in Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. May God bless the reading of his word tonight. There are times in our Christian walk when our faith falters, amen? Uh, there are times that we cave in to temptation temporarily and we flat out fail in our faith. There are other times when temptations, and that those temptations can be different for all of us, but they can just weigh upon us so heavily that it can cause us to think, man, I must be a terrible person. Even if you don't succumb to those temptations, just the weight of them when we've gone through periods of our life or seasons of our life where they're just bombarding us daily and we, we just must think, man, we, we feel bad even as Christians for having uh, those thoughts or those feelings, those temptations coming in, into our mind and upon our body. And sometimes these can also cause some Christians to doubt their salvation and personal commitment to Christ because they think that, well, if I was really Christian, surely I wouldn't have this thought that keeps coming to my mind and keep fighting it and, uh, or these feelings that I have to deal with. And as I said, those can be different for each one of us here and at different times in our life. But if we're not careful, one can be duped into thinking of, of this thought, how can Jesus ever accept me? A lot of people struggle with that. How can Jesus accept me? Or some are lured into the trap of assuming that Jesus is always appalled by them and always angry with them. And I've known Christians like that because they were raised like that. They were taught that Jesus is always angry with them, always mad at them. They're always on slippery ice in their relationship with Christ. And so uh, there are grown adults who sometimes struggle uh, with guilt and shame 
even when they haven't succumbed to certain temptations, but they've just dealt with the temptations. Well, again, I want to make uh, sure you understand, I'm not suggesting in any of these thoughts that Jesus approves of our falling into temptation and willfully sinning. Certainly not. We do grieve the Holy Spirit when we choose to act ungodly. And at times, if and when rebellious, unrepentant behavior continues, we not only know that biblically, but some of us know that uh, by what has happened by, through experience in our life, we know that the Lord disciplines us. But when he does, he disciplines us as a loving father in order to return us to fellowship with him so that we can be near to the heart of God and find great joy there and hope and happiness. Now, however, the scripture passage that we just read tonight, and especially the focal point being verse 15, reminds us that Jesus, our high priest, sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. That's precious. That Jesus Christ sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. To sympathize means to share or understand the feelings of another person. To sympathize also means to pity someone who is struggling Feel sorry for them or even show compassion towards them because you are feeling uh, sorry for them. Now as Christians, and we even read in verse 14, our confession of faith that we're, are, we are to hold fast to, our confession of faith, listen, this is the Jesus that we hold fast to. Uh, we hold fast that Jesus is the one and only Savior of mankind. We hold fast to the confession that he paid the price for our justification at Calvary. We hold fast to the confession that he, this Jesus, the Son of God, has risen from the dead on the third day and he has ascended in the heaven and he has taken his place at the right hand of God. This is part of our confession of who Jesus Christ is today. We believe from his own words that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth as well. And that he's been given the name above every name. This is also our confession. And we also believe that one day in all of his resurrected glory, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that this same Jesus is Lord. We believe because the Bible teaches us that he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is God in the flesh. He is the beginning and the end. He is the word of God made flesh. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. As Christians, we hold fast to this confession of who Jesus Christ is and what a confession that is to make. Now, knowing the greatness of his name, knowing the greatness of his power, knowing his holiness, we can at times... And I'm not saying it's intentionally, but we can shy away from Christ because of our weaknesses. Again, we get the complex that, well, this powerful, holy Christ who's at the right hand of God certainly doesn't want to hear from me, and especially now. Sometimes we can shy away because of our weaknesses, especially when our faith is weak. And again, we can uh, fall into the trap of believing the misinformation that this Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, is always disappointed and disgusted with us. And again, I, I've known Christians that feel that way. And some other Christians make people feel that way constantly. This causes us to stray in our faith many times, thinking that Christ could never love me or bless me because of my weaknesses. You know, the same thing happens to kids and young people in school. They, they look at an, another young person and they might see that young girl as beautiful, prettier than the average girl. They might see that young man as more handsome than the average boy, more athletic, more popular. 
And, and some kids don't see themselves in that light. And so what do they do? They feel so inferior and they assume that that person would never want anything to do with them. So what do they do? They shy away from those kids. Because again, why would that person want anything to do with me? And even though many times that's not the case. Sometimes it is. Many times that's not the case. I have misjudged people in my life. Maybe not in that way, but I'm sure I did in that way when I was young, but even as adults, there's been time I've misjudged people, and I was wrong about them. Get to know them better and began a wonderful relationship. Yeah. Yet the writer of Hebrews states, even as great as this Jesus is, even as powerful as he is, even as holy as he is, even as pure as he is, that he is sympathetic towards us. Why? Well, he pities us because of our weaknesses. That's what it says in verse 15. The Greek word for weakness is usually used in the Bible uh, to mean a moral weakness or to, to mean an intellectual weakness or it also is used interchangeably to mean a physical weakness weakness or there are times where it could also mean all three of those together at once in other words in our weakness morally intellectually and physically we have limitations don't we we have limitations now this doesn't just mean that he sympathizes with us because we have feelings of inadequacy that's not what the scriptures say there. But he sympathizes with us because of our ineffectiveness to totally overcome our moral and our intellectual and our physical weaknesses upon our own accord, our own wisdom, and our own strength. He sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. Again, morally, intellectually, and physically. However, this verse isn't saying that he just pities us as, uh, as a Greek god might uh, be used to think, well, the Zeus has had favor on us this time because of our weakness and he's showing mercy. No, no, no. This verse isn't saying even that he pities us as we might pity, let's say, a, a person that is crippled in their legs. But, and we pity them because we can walk and they can't. And, that's not even the reason he sympathizes with us. Even though that is some, a reason that we do sympathize with people, the scripture doesn't even say necessarily that's the reason that he sympathizes with us. Then why is Jesus sympathetic towards us in our trials of life and, yes, in our temptations? How can he... How can this Jesus be sympathetic towards us in this regard? Well, again, I read verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. There's your answer. That's why he sympathizes with us. Because he has been tempted in every respect. Think about those words. In every respect as we are. He can be sympathetic and he is sympathetic because he was tempted and tried like we are in every respect. And again, beloved, isn't this the good news of Jesus Christ that because of our weaknesses, because of our ineffectiveness to go to God in our own moral and in our own mental and in our own physical state, we couldn't get to God. So God put on flesh and came to us in the person of Jesus Christ and he lived among us. That's the good news. This is the heart of Christ for sinners on earth in which we all were. He is not only a doctor. Listen to this. 
We call Jesus the great physician, don't we? And that with good reason we call him. But he's not only a doctor with the medicine to relieve us of our disease. This Jesus, God in the flesh, willingly took upon himself our disease. The disease of this hard and difficult life. And he did that, that he might become the very medicine that brings relief and healing to us. There's a difference, though, that we also read in verse 15. Again, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. And what are those last three words? Yet without sin. That's the difference. Jesus didn't sin. He was tempted as we are in every respect. He knew trials. He knew pain. He knew heartache. He knew what it felt like to be betrayed, left, alone. But this is the difference. The difference is this, that he lived this life and he endured all of its ailments without sin. Jesus Christ remained pure, holy, and innocent. Now, you might say, yeah, I know that, Pastor Allen. I know that. I've been taught that since I was young. You realize, though, the, uh, statistically, uh, there are more and more people, even some within the church, that believe Jesus sinned. but he remains pure and holy and innocent. Now, I want to ask this. Go back and put yourself in the teenager's shoes who looks at the strong, uh, athletic young man, and this young man might be weak and awkward, and he feels inferior to this young man who just scored three touchdowns at the last Friday night football game. Or you plug in your scenario there. There's a difference. Does that make Jesus less able to identify with us? And does that make us less able to identify with him? Because he was tempted as we are, yet we sinned, and he didn't. Well... Consider that he was tempted like us in every respect and even greater. He was tempted even to a greater point, if you will. Why? Because he never gave in to the trial and temptation that he faced. He went farther than us. So considering, think about this in this light, if you will, he actually, even though he was tempted in every respect as we are, yet he did so without sin, he actually suffered more and he had more to lose as the son of God. So I think that it makes him more able to identify with mankind and we still are dealing, as we still are dealing with the tests and the toils and the trials and the burdens of this life. Think of it this way. When we go through certain trials that throw us into the mud of the world, we often feel, what, isolated. We often feel alone. We often assume that no one, as the old uh, spiritual says, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, right? Sometimes among our friends, it might be true. We do experience things that they have not. But the great thing is, is the further we sink into the earth with our trials and toils and temptations, there Jesus is, knowing exactly what we're going through, exactly what we're dealing with, and he is there to strengthen us, to help us, and to guide us through it. Why? Because he sympathizes with us and our weaknesses. Because he endured all the temptations and toils we did too. And even farther, further. And many times when we're tempted, 
heavily, we quit fighting and lay down. In other words, we give in. In other words, we sin. Jesus was tempted heavily, but he didn't quit fighting, and he didn't lay down, and he didn't give in, and he fought for our sake. And that is why we can trust this Jesus, and this is why we can rest upon his promises. This is why we can find strength in and through our relationship with him. This is why and how Jesus Christ can sympathize with us. See, Jesus understands not just like you, but better than anyone that living in this cursed world is hard. That living in this fallen world is challenging to say the least. That it is many times can be deflating. Jesus understands that. He understands and sympathizes with our broken hearts because he's had his heart broken too. He's wept. He understands what disappointment is. He understands what sorrow is greater than any of us. He is or was a man of sorrows when he walked upon this earth and yet had more joy than anyone. Jesus understands our anxieties. When we read about the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that uh, he was betrayed and before Judas came with that kiss of betrayal, Jesus is in the garden and I know there's famous pictures where he's just sitting there leaning against a rock and there's light coming down and he's so peaceful. But that's not the picture the Bible gives of that night. That he's sweating drops of blood and that his anxiety and depression was so great he was throwing himself on the ground and to the point that he thought he, he was going to die before he even got to the cross. So yes, Jesus understands our anxieties and our times of depression. He understands our disappointment, our sorrow. He knows what literal cuts to the flesh feel like. He understands what, what bruises feel like. He understands physical pain, what it takes to endure that. Beloved, that's why Jesus Christ is the greatest counselor and friend that we can ever have. Now, you might be thinking tonight that no one knows what you're going through. Most might not. You might have even been tempted to, uh, maybe today even, think the thought that really no one cares. You might be just wishing that another human being would look upon your life with some sympathy and care for you as you are silently maybe broken, battered, and bruised from this life. I just want to remind you tonight, Jesus knows. I want to remind you tonight that Jesus cares. And I want to remind you tonight that Jesus will guide you through the way. Why? because he paved the road himself. And that's why he sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. And it is because he is risen and powerful and full of glory as God in the flesh that we are to hold fast to our confession of faith, that verse 14. But it is also because this very same Jesus is so tender and so compassionate and so sympathetic towards us that we can approach the throne of grace, as it says in verse 16. How? With confidence. Why can we approach the throne of grace with confidence? Because we're great enough? Because we have such a high priest who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. 
who's put on our flesh and walked among us, who gave his life for us at Calvary. This is why we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. And as it says, we do so that we may receive something. We may receive mercy and find grace to do what? Help in our time of need. Dan Ortland wrote this. If you are in Christ, by that he means a Christian. If you are in Christ, you have a friend who, in your sorrow, will never lob down a pep talk from heaven. He goes on to say, he cannot bear to hold himself at a distance. Nothing can hold him back. His heart is too bound up to yours. This is yet another reason, as a close tonight, of why, yes, we can find hope and happiness for our lives in the heart of Christ. Jesus, believe it or not, is sympathetic with your weaknesses tonight. Your moral weakness, your intellectual weakness, your physical weakness. He is sympathetic towards you. That's why we call upon him. That's why we wait upon him and believing that in his time, he will renew our strength and see us through. Gracie has begun to cry. I think that means I need to hush. I pray you've been encouraged by the heart of Christ tonight, not by my words, but by who Jesus is. My friend, he cares for you and where you are tonight. He sympathizes with your weaknesses. Find hope there. Father, what scripture that brings such joy to our soul. May you and you alone be our hope. We thank you for grace, uh, unearned, unmerited favor from heaven upon our life. We thank you for mercy, the many mercies that you show us each and every new day. And God, as we all have struggles in these pews tonight and those even at home or where they might be watching this, you know what we're going through and you've been through it and you've gone even deeper. And so God ministering to our souls tonight. Bring healing to the broken heart tonight. Bring healing to the wounds that have struck us and left us in pain. Encourage our hearts with your heart. And then, God, as you put your salve upon our wounds, help us also, we who are in Christ, to place the healing salve of your heart upon others who are hurting. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us online tonight. Again, we're looking forward to this upcoming Lord's Day. We hope that you'll be with us, if at all possible. Sunday school at 10, worship at 11, Sunday evening at 6.30. And uh, hope you do have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.